Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for such great music again today. Danny, what a great sermon you had there earlier. Man, you're really getting good. Uh, you know, uh, Mother's Day is, well, it's not always easy being a mom, is it? There's, there's those wonderful moments of joy and ecstasy, and then there's, there's other times. You may have heard the funny story about Mrs. Smith and her son, Chad. And Chad was at that uh, awkward age of not being old enough to drive, but old enough to date. And so he needed to rely, much to his dislike, on his mom to show for him on this first date. But he had strict instructions. He said, now look, mom, just drive. Don't turn around. Don't try to talk to my girlfriend. Don't embarrass me. Any of you been there? So Mrs. Smith took Chad to pick up his date, stared straight ahead just like she was told. Son opened the car door, and when she heard it slam shut, she followed Chad's wishes, stared straight ahead, didn't look around, drove away in silence, and as they went down the street, the uh, girl shyly leaned forward and said, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Smith, uh, Chad didn't have time to get in the car. He's still standing in the driveway. <laughs> when I first started in ministry, I, on Mother's Day, I gave advice to mothers. <laughs> and then Jan and I had kids of our own. <laughs> and so we offered sympathy and encouragement and hope. Some of you remember Dave Ramsey. He does the um, financial peace. And in there, he tells the story about his wife says to him one Sunday morning as they're getting ready for church, she said, hey, how about if we change roles this morning? How about if you go get the kids ready for church in Sunday school and I'll get in the car and honk the horn? <laughs> <laughs> and then I experienced... Uh, life with its ups and downs and its joys and its loss and its challenges. And so I bring, I've tended the last many years to bring words of comfort and understanding and appreciation, which leads us to these two scripture passages that you'll see on your screen. And by the way, isn't that a great picture on the front of your bulletin and on the screen? <laughs> Pat, Pat uh, Meredith? Pat Meredith. <laughs> Uh, if you see her at the front desk, she's just so creative and good. And she says, I, I don't think, I don't put people on this Mother's Day. Animals work really well. She's really wise. But I love this image of God. In Luke's gospel, we read of God like a waiting father searching for that prodigal to return home. But in Isaiah, it's as a mother. I wish the world would gather these images of God instead of some that they choose to gather, this mother who comforts her child. And so you will be comforted in Jerusalem. And then in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says these words, I'm grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember constantly, you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And I have a suspicion that today on Mother's Day, some gifts are being stirred up, the memories of how mom has touched our lives and have been a part of some unconditional, amazing love. I also like to say a word of, to those who stay at home moms. Uh, you remember perhaps T Tony Campolo, he was a great speaker, writer, teacher, professor, sociologist, 
a Christian writer, funny guy. He taught at the University of Pennsylvania. In his book, The Power of Delusion, he writes this. Too many times women are made to feel that they should apologize to being mothers and housewives when in reality such roles are noble callings. When he was on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania, there were gatherings from time to time to which faculty members brought their spouses. Inevitably, some woman professor or sociologist or engineer would confront my wife with the question, and what is it you do, my dear? My wife is one of the most brilliantly articulate individuals I know, had a great response. So good, I think I put it on the screen, did I? Oh, Debbie, you're amazing. She says, I am socializing two homo sapiens in the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for the transformation of the social order into the teleologically prescribed utopia inherent in the eschaton. <laughs> and then she would say, and what is it you do, my dear? <laughs> it's pretty good stuff. She was instilling into her children these character, these values. Now, as you know, I asked uh, you to help me with this sermon, and uh, you all, so many of you, felt like I needed help. You gave me a lot of responses. Actually, they're really, really helpful. All kinds of feelings on Mother's Day. Yesterday, Jan and I, Jan brings her mom down to get her nails done, and she comes in the door and shows me her nails, this 92-year-old princess of a woman. And then we had a joyous time together. But there's also the joys and the cards and the celebrations and the tears and the empty chairs and the spaces. One email said, oh man, I, I may not even attempt to come to the service. I lost my mother the end of January. So far, church is the hardest place for me to return to. Too many memories. Another said, for some reason, Mother's Day always sends me over the edge. I find it better not to submit myself to these opportunities to plunge into despair. And then there are all those normal, challenging, relational things that happen between mothers and children, between members and congregation. This honest email says, Mom was, is a handful. She loved me to death. I need to forgive and love her more. Mothers are all too human. Love them, honor them, forgive them. She did the best she could. It's a good word for all of us in a congregation, isn't it? The people next to you doing the best they can. <laughs> they may not be perfect. They aren't. But we love them, we honor them, we forgive them. This person said, Mom was a tower of strength. We were farmers. One year the crops failed. My father was ready to give up. My mom was determined that we were not going to give up. She got a job and became an office manager and worked that job for 25 years. And my mom, we would come home from school, and if we were lucky, the Omar man. Anybody ever heard of the Omar man? Oh, there's one blessed soul back there. Oh, over here? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a guy who brought pastries around to the farmers, and so we would have this beautiful cake with cream-filled stuff. And so we'd stay and get in from school. We'd milk that time as long as we could before we had to go out and do the chores at the farm, and Mom always let us talk. The kids gave their mom some flowers. We might give them permission to take care of yourself. We might give them Encouragement to be honest about how you really feel. Affirmation that they're noticed and appreciated and give them wonderful hugs. I, I've got three or four more. I hope you don't mind them. I, maybe because I know these people and if you knew their names, you would feel this close kinship with these words, but I'm going to share them. Sometimes mothers have to be dads as well. Our father, our father was killed in France during World War II. My sister and I were fortunate to have a mother who was brave 
adventurous, caring, self-reliant, strong, stern, compassionate, independent, and much more. She was a wonderful parent. If you knew this person, you'd see all of these qualities in her. Hi, Dan. I wasn't sure I was going to share anything about mothers because my whole experience of mother was a mixed bag. My mom died when I was four years old, and my dad married someone who was mean to me. I knew I needed to be a good mom to my son, and that is what defines me now, is knowing I was a really good mom to my son. I was able to teach him about faith and love and forgiveness. I'm so glad God chose me to be my son's mom, for he did because he was adopted. I love being mom. Hi, Dan. My mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was about 25 years old. In the early stages, Mother's Day was okay because I could still see her and she still knew who I was. As the Alzheimer's took more and more of her memory, I grew to dread Mother's Day. As my mom was still alive, but she really wasn't. So even the thought of sending a card was rough, as I knew she couldn't read it. I opted for a card with a pretty picture instead of of a nice sentiment. My mom passed away in 2005. In 2006, I had my first Mother's Day in years. I knew mom was whole and with God and now my daughters could celebrate me and I didn't need to worry about my mom. I hope my daughters won't have to go through the same thing with me, but just in case, I have a bin with special keepsakes for them and notes in case I can't remember. I have a baby doll saved for them to give me, and I've told them to just put me in the fountains <laughs> and let me watch the birds. That's a building, not fountains. <laughs> and please don't feel guilty about not visiting, as I won't remember anyway. Are these touching you like they are me? Esther, I'm going to read yours. It was so good. My mom is a hero. Not bragging, but it's the simple truth. She survived the Cuban Revolution, birthed two children in a foreign country, one at home, ran a medical clinic that served dozens of children daily, learned a new language and culture, all by the time she was 30. During our time in Cuba, my mother wrote to her parents in their home in Clearwater, Florida, every week, she didn't want them to worry about the news reports they heard on TV about dictators bombing revolutionaries. And there were definitely times they should have been worried. My grandmother saved those letters, hundreds of them, and gave them to my brothers and me. We have a very personal and powerful look, not only at our family, but a memoir about the nexus of culture and faith and politics. We think our times now are divided. We had both Batista soldiers and supporters of Fidel Castro in our dad's church. If you don't agree with somebody near you, that's just small potatoes compared to what you were talking about, isn't it? Those letters will ultimately go to Candler School of Theology's Library for Preservation, not your ordinary mom. And then the last. I lost my mom to cancer in 2001. She was the tie that bound our family. Her name was Mary, very fitting to this lady. After raising five children and one grandchild with every trial a child brings with growing up, and there were many, her love was there unconditionally. She loved us most when we had a hard lesson to learn. Did you catch that? She loved us most when, most when we had a hard lesson to learn. Isn't God like that? The people who say that pe children or youth or adults in rebellion, they must be far from God. But God loves them most <laughs> when they're going through a hard time. She remains the strongest, wisest person I've ever known. One of my greatest memories I hold to is our Sundays together, just the two of us at church together alone. Eight people in the house, but I got her alone on Sundays. She taught me faith. Cancer took her slowly, and I asked God, why would you take the most precious thing in my life? I watched her go, and peace came. The lines in her face were gone. Rest, Mary. 
She was the tie that bound our family together. Her love for us was unconditional. And both of those things are characteristic of so many moms, and they're so characteristic of God, that God is the tie that binds us, and his love for us is unconditional. Now, I want to say a personal word to you as your interim pastor. One of the new people said, hey, look, it says your last Sunday is the 23rd of June. I said, she said, are you retiring? I said, yeah, again, we're going to do that again. <laughs> but this is the first chance I've said to say anything to you since um, you learned that your new pastor's family are going to be Corey and Carol and Gavin and Isaiah. And you've been through a lot of changes in the last couple of years, haven't you? And a year ago, you didn't know what to expect, did you? How many of you thought, oh, brother, what is this next guy going to do to us? Be honest. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It hasn't been too bad, has it? You got through it? Oh, oh. You know, Jan and I felt the same way about you. But we feel this way, too, about you. What a great congregation. Your love is unconditional. And so I want to tie together an idea of mom and then this church, that you continue to be that way, like a mother comforting her children, gathering her children. And you'll, you'll gather Corey and... Carol and Gavin and Isaiah, and you'll love them unconditionally, and you'll join arm in arm and hand in hand, as you've done with us, and it'll be exciting to see. There'll be stumbles, there'll be mistakes. I made some, I just didn't tell you about them, but, <laughs> but word spreads, I noticed that. <laughs> I go in the office after not being there two days, and I hear stuff, so at any rate. So I've got this slideshow. Several of you said you really liked our pictures. I don't know if you're being nice or you really like them, but this will be the last time. I've got about 12 slides for you, but I'm going to use them to try to pull this together. So let's look at the first one out, our trip out west. This is from Zion National Park, and it's a towering monolith. And if you look closely, there's a little waterfall as a teardrop. And it reminds me of Mom my mom and moms, but it reminds me of this church, that you're a tower of strength and there's a tenderness to you. Did you know that? <laughs> there's a tenderness here. This past Sunday, the last two Sundays, there's a young man that's come in at, towards the end of this service or the beginning of next service, and last Sunday he had a, a beer can in his hand and he was disturbed, but I'm going to talk about you, Robin, but... <laughs> Robin went back and was with that young man, and they went outside, and Robin was more pastoral than I've ever been in my life. Robin, you were tender and strong, and there's a tenderness and there's a joy about this congregation and people like you and Mel, and we're grateful you're here. We're grateful you're here. Aren't you grateful for Robin? This next slide is Bryce Canyon, and those are like the, that's like the people of Pasadena Community Church. See all those individual hootas? That's all of you. Some of you are the frozen chosen, but most of you aren't. Uh, <laughs> and you think those things never change or move, but they do, and so do you. <laughs> and you grow, and so I see that, and I think of you all. The next picture is in Red Canyon on the way to Bryce, and Pasadena has a way of finding a way. I tell you the truth, when we first arrived and took a tour of upstairs in the Hamilton, I thought, holy cow, this is a mess. How are we going to find a way through? But you did. <laughs> I hope you'll come and look at that next week. And then the next one is 
what Peggy and John Gay kept telling us about Escalante and the Grand Staircase, and we had no idea. This picture does not do justice, but that's the Million Dollar Highway. And Listen, friends, you found a way. Years ago, they found a way to park more cars here than you could ever imagine. They found a way to let people from the outside listen in, and you'll find a way to move forward, just as moms find a way. The next slide is a picture I took of me as shadow, because I want to tell you this. I have a shadow side, and you have a shadow side. Did you know that? Every one of us has a shadow side. What do I mean? You have, you have that side of yourself you, you just aren't aware is there. It's like when Paul says in Romans 7, what I want to do, I end up not doing. What I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who will free me? What's going on inside of me? And sometimes you're not even that aware. And sometimes things come out of your mouth. You think, what? Be aware we all have a shadow side. So cut other people slack and yourself. And then the next is, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because faith is strong and you've been nurtured in the faith. And then the next one is what I call Queen Nefertiti, the queen of Egypt. And I wouldn't say some of you think of yourselves this way, but uh, no, I won't. But notice how precarious she is there. And then the following is called Balance Rock. And life is balancing, isn't it? It's a balancing act. And then the next is what we know as a kiva. It's a, the Pueblo Indians built these homes down into the ground so they'd be cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And you just find a way to take care of your family. You, you do as parents, you do as moms and dads, and you do as a church, you find a way. And thankfully, you've got great resources here. I see, uh, I see RJ and Aaron in the back. And you know what? They and the Monday morning guys and Terry Lee have done more than you can imagine to get the second floor, and now they've got all the carpet torn up in the choir room, <laughs> and they've got that getting ready to be totally refurbished. Would you say a word of thanks to RJ and Aaron? Thank you, RJ. I'm almost done. Uh, this next one, I just like this picture. It's called Twin Rocks Cafe. And don't go through life alone. Have a friend. And then the next one is tapestry. And you're weaving a tapestry. And you're going to add some colors. And it's going to be even more beautiful. Because the more colors, the more beautiful, right? And then comes Monument Valley, and you can almost see John Wayne riding up there. And <laughs> stagecoach. And it's an iconic picture from John Ford, but this church is iconic, and it has a message of God's treat, wonderful love. Don't take that for granted. The world doesn't hear enough of that. You proclaim it. And then finally, this is, this is a nondescript picture because you can't, tell, you can't tell a book by its cover. You can't tell a person by just first impressions. This is Antelope Canyon, and it's, you can walk around there for days and not know the next slide. The next slide, this beautiful canyon. These next three slides, go ahead, just show through them to me. Isn't that amazing? Antelope Canyon in Pace, Arizona. Jan and I had no idea, and this Navajo guy took us in. And those pictures are free for you this morning, so... At any rate, let me finish. A few weeks ago, Garth Brooks was in Gainesville, Florida. Did any of you go to his concert? Everybody in Gainesville that I ever knew went to that concert, about 80,000, 90,000 people. And he wrote this song about his mom. The little baby told God, hey, I'm kind of scared. Don't really know if I want to go down there. From here, it looks like a little blue ball. That's a great big place, and I'm so small. Why can't I just stay here with you? Did I make you mad? Don't you want me too? God said, oh, child, of course I do, but there's somebody special waiting for you. So hush now, baby, don't you cry, because there's somebody down there waiting who's only going life, is making sure you're always going to be all right. 
A loving angel, tender, tough, and strong. It's almost time to go and meet your mom. You'll never have a better friend or a warmer touch to tuck you in. She'll kiss you bruises, your bumps and scrapes, and any time you hurt, her heart's going to break. And when she's talking to you, make sure you listen close because she's going to teach you everything you'll ever need to know, like how to mind your manners, to love and laugh and dream. And she'll put your on the path that will bring you back to me. Pray with me, would you? Oh God, we give you thanks this day. I ask you forgiveness. Sometimes I wasn't always the best, the mom. I suppose most of us are like that. But how we love her and the other moms in our lives. Thank you for this day. And that you're like a mother comforting your child. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing song?